welcome back, everybody. You know what's wrong, Brad? What? We're on opposite sides that we're usually on. Oh, this is embarrassing, isn't it? I don't like this side of the bed. Well, maybe we can fix it tomorrow on the live show because um, <laughs> the, the rodeo is, is already uh, in Left progress. Left the station. Yes. <laughs> but, um, yes. yeah. Okay. But uh, before we dive in there, folks, today's show is brought to you by Cloudberry Lab. Check them out at cloudberrylab.com slash FRD, and they can pretty much help you back up to uh, Azure, Amazon S3, Google, pretty much anything you want. Bring your data, pick your cloud, and go from there. Check them out at cloudberrylab.com slash FRD, but don't check out Paul because um, he's on the wrong side. It's really weird. This is very awkward, actually. It is kind of strange. It's like when your wife takes the other side of the bed when you go to a hotel. You're like, what are you doing? Yeah, you're like, like what are you doing? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I do that on home swaps. It's like we're gonna be in this bed for three weeks and she throws her stuff down on what on my side. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you doing? Yeah. Pretty much. Um Paul, there's a lot actually going on. Um mm -hmm. some of the information will be fresh to people if they haven't checked out the site uh, this afternoon. But first let's dive into the earnings here. Just a quick little overview here. Uh twenty eight point nine billion in revenue. That's actually Sounds pretty good because, as Paul and I always joke, you can throw a you know just throw the darts at it. It's going to be somewhere in the mid to low twenties, and actually, this is creeping yep. up there. Uh, yep. Net income, this is non GAAP, and I'll explain why here in a minute. Of seven point five billion uh, for people not financially savvy, that's how much money they have left over and how much money they can reinvest in the company uh, because they had to take a massive tax charge around 13 and a half billion because what they're doing is they're taking i believe it's over a hundred billion dollars that's overseas they're that's bringing right. all that money back to the u.s so they have to take a one-time tax charge thanks to new uh financial laws that have been passed and that yep. way they it's called repatriation of the money mm -hmm. and that's it exactly right an ideal time to do so and so realistically they're bringing all that money back home maybe to buy ea just kidding i'm just speculating there but, uh, <laughs> well, that's a good speculation i mean and by the way you know we know that apple previously announced that they were going to repatriate some sum i don't remember the number mm -hmm. some enormous hundreds of millions of uh, hundreds of billions of dollars worth what apple didn't announce at that time because they'll announce it today as part of their own quarterly earnings is the initial upfront tax hit they will take yep. which could well, actually, in Apple's case, it probably won't be a loss, but it will significantly, you know, impact their net. Well, their net profits, I guess we would call it, mm -hmm. uh, for the quarter. So when when Microsoft first announced that, I was a little confused by that. But actually, we've known about this for weeks. So yep, um, several weeks ago, uh, there were stories about how you know Microsoft, Cisco, Google, uh, Pfizer, Apple would all be taking this small one-time hit uh, to their well to their profits, actually, and then would benefit in an enormous way by getting a huge tax break yep. on uh, repatriated money. Yeah. And so uh, I'm not quite sure what they're going to do all with all that dinero, but uh, every company's doing it. It's just depending on how much. And they didn't announce the amount, right? I actually sort of expected in the conference call afterwards mm -hmm. that they would reveal, hey, we're we're going to take $120 you know, billion or whatever the figure is. Yeah. And bring it back to the United States. They actually didn't do that. I, I'm, that was a little surprising. Yeah, I somebody did the back of the napkin math and said they've got roughly 130 billion overseas. Um, yeah, so they'll so, probably take 90 percent of it and bring it yep. back, which you know, yeah, it was roughly 120, whatever that is. But um, I, if you look at the investor website, I believe there's a, I don't know if it's Goldman Sachs or some kind of a financial forum thing coming up, and they must be announcing it there. there there's no way they're going to allow uh, too much time to pass before they reveal what they're doing with this money. That's right. <laughs> uh, other other notable figures surface uh, basically flat. They they quoted a one percent figure of growth. Um, that's that's uh, it's actually worse than, you, than you're yeah. giving it credit for because the one percent was revenue. Um, surface unit sales actually fell year over year, and the reason the revenues were only a little bit higher is because the they're selling more premium devices. You know the 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 per average per cost you know. Jeez. Average price per machine is a little higher, uh, but they actually sold fewer devices. I, that is a disaster, and um, the reason is they announced four new Surface models this past year. If you go look at the year-ago quarter, they released none in the quarters uh, leading up to that announcement, and they released two products, Surface Book with Performance Base and Surface Studio, both of which were niche products in that quarter. 
somehow in that quarter a year ago, they sold more devices than they did this past quarter. And that is nuts to me. I, I really thought that Surface Laptop was going to be not just a mainstream success story for them, but that it would quickly become the best-selling Surface device of all time. And when and, you say four service device, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, because I, I was thinking three, but I see, I think I understand what you're saying. So they have Surface mm -hmm. Laptop, they have Surface yep. Pro, and then they yep. have Surface Book 2 13-inch and Surface Book 2 15-inch. Oh, I was adding in the Surface Book with LTE, uh, uh, Surface Pro with LTE as the fourth. Yeah, you're right. There was actually, I mean, I guess if you look at it that way, they're almost, you know, you could say four or five. But um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a significant revamping of their entire mm -hmm. portable product line. Yep, virtually their entire product line, and one percent revenues, and uh, uh, we don't know; they never say, mm -hmm. but a falling in um, uh, unit sales. If I look, if you look at their 10Q announcement, there's a figure in there for the revenues that it generated, um, and not the actual full revenues, but in other words, what it says is something like, and I'm, again, I hate doing stuff off the top of my head. I'm sorry, but it's something to the tune of 126 million dollars ish gain now we know that's a one percent gain so it's not too oh i'm sorry did I say, yeah one percent gain so it's it's not too hard to kind of do the math on this thing still being like a billion dollar business but it's weird to me that they didn't say that and the other thing is surface sales are of course going to fall again this quarter although when you look at quarter over quarter it's a little uneven because obviously it was a holiday quarter this past quarter the current quarter is the middle of the winter it's not exactly a big selling season um but i wouldn't be surprised to discover in fact I, it's almost a guarantee um that surface sales will be down this quarter as well and it's you have to kind of wonder you know a year ago when we were having this conversation it was like why are they not upgrading their computers but mm -hmm. now they they have and it's still not working and i don't i can't explain this like i really I really thought we were going to see something much better than this. Yeah, um, I, I really I was going to say some like great insightful thing that explains all <laughs> this, but um, I, I've I I don't know. Um, yeah, it's a tough one, you know. I mean, somebody can make the argument that hey, maybe most of the new devices were sold uh, last quarter before back to school, and granted, those numbers were up. But this is the holiday shopping season where we know devices should be selling. Um, By the way, on that note, here's another one for you. Um, Xbox unit sales for consoles also went down in the quarter. They kind of buried that a little bit mm. um, because obviously the um, Xbox One X launched. And yeah. just like with service, Surface, they saw a revenue increase because the price per unit is much higher in this case. They were selling right. Xbox One S for as low as I think $200 over the holiday selling period. Um, Xbox One X sold for $500. And so there's a significant mm -hmm. increase in the average cost of the console. But they still sold fewer than they did a year ago. And it's like, guys, seriously. like I, I, I find myself saying the same thing over and over again with Microsoft. This applies to a lot of the stuff they do with Windows 10. It applies to a lot of the stuff they do with the developers. Mm -hmm. And now it's kind of applying to Surface and Xbox, which is this. I don't think they can do anything else. Like, I... I I look at what they've done. I, I think the Xbox strategy in particular is excellent. And I think to myself, they are literally doing everything they can to fire on all cylinders. Yep. And it's weird how some of these things just don't seem to be panning out. You know, it just doesn't seem right. I Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, the Xbox, I'm not... The Surface is what's more concerning to me. Because we always... The right. Xbox One X is 500 bucks for a console. That's expensive. Um, this is the Xbox One S is pretty far along into its life cycle. Yep. Um, Eight percent rise. Yeah, I think this is why we're starting to see them make that software approach, right, with the, the yeah. Game Pass, because now they're saying, okay, we look like they're probably doing some back the napkin math, saying maybe we're starting to hit saturation of people who are gonna buy a console. And so, oh, what are, totally. What, what's yeah. the next step to get somebody to buy a console and or switch or do whatever? And well. Um, I mean, think of it this way. Um, with the exception of Apple, there's no such thing as high margins on hardware, right? Mm. So um, uh, they'll never say what the margins are. The margins on Xbox are probably negative something. So the, the margins on Microsoft's cloud business, like consumer cloud is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, commercial cloud, is like 55%. It's incredible. 
And so you can see the rationale for moving video gaming to a cloud-based business, right? Very that much so. The goal for this is we're going to tread water while we have to with consoles, but the reality is we want to get to this thing being cloud delivery of games to whatever device. And that's, that's the point at which this thing makes tons of sense. And that's why Microsoft's doing this. It's why Microsoft is expanding their gaming business. But man, you look at the console stuff and it's tough. Like I, I mean, they did outsell PlayStation in the United States mm-hmm. only in the five weeks leading up to Christmas or whatever. And that's fantastic, right? That's great. Um, but if you look at the le- rest of the year, they didn't, <laughs> you know, and unfortunately for full calendar year, whatever, um, they come in third place, right? Behind uh, PS4 and the Switch, right? The, it's, uh, Nintendo has sold an ungodly number of those things. Sony has sold even more PlayStation 4s. It's, it's, it's like a train that just keeps on going. Well... Uh, one area <laughs> that things are a little bit rosier, definitely on the mm-hmm. Azure side. Um, yes. Again, 90-ish plus percent growth. I, the story just keeps repeating over and over. It's like a broken record. <laughs> Azure is the future of Microsoft, and I don't think there's really anybody that disputes that. Um, yeah. you know, that's- well, although, uh, you know, since I am apparently the bringer of bad news, I, did, I, w- I will point this out. You're right. I mean... Uh, the- Obviously, the future of Microsoft is cloud. Obviously, we're seeing huge growth in cloud. Um, the one thing that's a little interesting about this, I've often complained that Microsoft talks about something called its commercial cloud. Um, Microsoft doesn't have a commercial cloud business. What it does is it cherry picks mm-hmm. certain businesses from two of its other business units, lumps them into a, a number and says, look, this is commercial cloud. It's the it's the business offerings that we have in the cloud, right? Office 365, yep. Azure, Dynamics 365, et cetera. Um, the revenues from that business were approximately... Five point, I don't remember the number, 5.3 billion, somewhere in that um, area. Yeah, actually, they are exactly 5.3. Um, Microsoft's total revenues for the quarter were 28.9. That means that approximately, what is that, one sixth <laughs> of their revenues come from that commercial cloud business, which we both would describe and did describe as the future of Microsoft. And so that's kind of a cute way of saying future's not quite here yet, right? Um, it's growing, right. and and we don't have a way. We wish we did, but we don't really have a way to compare what Microsoft offers from a financial perspective or from a, I don't know, I guess we'd call it usage share perspective when you compare it to Amazon. But the feeling is they're number two. We have no data to back that up. <laughs> you know, but that's, that's the feeling, and um, I'm sure it's true. I mean, I'm sure it's true, but they still have a ways to go. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Um, speaking of uh, ways to go here, Paul, uh, have we on this show ever talked about <laughs> what is this thing? Have we have about we ever split talked... broadcaster? No, but we should. What is that thing? <laughs> Why is it not changing? Oh, you're trying to change. Oh, you're trying to do like a full screen thing. Look at you. Yeah, I don't know why it's not changing on my end though. But we'll we'll just leave it right here. Okay. I mean, not, okay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, on this show, Paul. Have mm-hmm. we ever talked about Windows lifecycle and that the rapid release just may not be great for um, the enterprise? Have we, have we ever mentioned that? I feel like I might literally talk about that in my sleep. Yeah. I feel uh, like I have been beating a drum saying that this Windows as a service thing doesn't make any sense, especially for businesses, which don't like to just upgrade on a slower basis, but do not like to upgrade at all. Yeah. Um, funny you mentioned that. Uh, Microsoft is announcing today, and if you're not familiar with this, I definitely recommend go checking out the post, um, mm-hmm. that they are extending lifecycle support for Windows 10 versions 1607, 1703, 1709 by six months. Right. Uh, why, why, why would they do that? Why would they do that? Uh, because most of their customers have come back to them and said, are you insane? We are not upgrading. And they've had to give in. Now, uh, you reminded me because I couldn't remember, but 1511, they had also... Mm-hmm. Um, extended the support life cycle for by six months. And at the time, I said, they're going to do this for every version. There's no way. The current schedule is untenable. Uh, the, yep. the current schedule being 18 months, right? So yep. uh, 20, six months is 24 months, two years. Um, I'm thinking we get it out to three. And then guess what? We're right back where we started, where a new version of Windows comes out every three years for these goons. And it is, it is just the dumbest thing in the world to take your... Uh, most conservative customer base, which, by the way, is the majority of your customer base, yep. and insist that they completely 180 degree turn around and do something completely different. Um, it's never going to work. It's not working now. 
it's it's just never going to work. Except for one thing. Did you catch the the little? I mean, it's, it's very it, well. I don't know how subtle it is. I thought it was subtle, but there's a bunch of little things in this announcement that don't relate directly to Windows 10, but that point to the little the other half of the coin. How they're going to get you to go to Windows 10. Did you see this stuff? Are you referring to Office by any chance? Yes, I am. Hmm. So current and future versions of Office, right? Things like Office 365 Pro Plus, which has always been very closely aligned with Windows 10 from a support life cycle perspective. And then the, the next version, and I think the last version, of Perpetual Office, with their, which they're calling Office 2019 and is arriving at the uh, second half of this year. Going forward, will require Windows 10. So Which is if you're, it, it's it's actually I and listen uh, here. This will be Microsoft's next step back from the cliff moment because mm-hmm. this is not going to work. So in other words, if you're an enterprise and you have adopted Windows 10 Enterprise, you know, uh, well actually, I'm sorry. Let me step back. I'm sorry. You've adopted Office 365 Pro Plus Enterprise or yep. Pro Plus. You could run that thing on Windows 7. You could run it on Windows 8. You could run it on any version of Windows 10 starting, I don't know if it's starting effective immediately or sometime this year, you will need to be on Windows 10. So, yeah, they've extended the support lifecycle on Windows 10. Nice. Thank you for giving us that. But they're also taking away the ability to combine those two things unless you're on Windows 10. Office 2019, the next version of Office, will require Windows 10. I feel like... Seriously? Knowing exactly what we talked about five seconds before this with that, this update and uh, mm-hmm. lifecycle extension support, I feel like this is them standing in, in a pit of rattlesnakes saying, come on in, the, the water's fine. The water's great, yeah, exactly. Like, I, 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 look, I don't know. I mean, th- there has to be a business reason for this insanity. You know, I, mm-hmm. There are people who have access to numbers and data and whatever that I don't have, obviously. Um, they're not idiots, but <laughs> this is still rather idiotic. I mean, it's crazy. Are you sure about that? Well, I, no, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I know a lot of these guys. They're smart. You know, they, they're good guys. Um, but, man, they just keep punching themselves in the face with this licensing stuff. It just, it just doesn't make sense. In fact, I think the whole thing doesn't make sense. From All the way from Windows 10 Home, where you literally are a guinea pig for Windows updates, in the sense that you cannot defer them, mm-hmm. and you must accept them every month, all the way up through the enterprise. I, I, if you, you can point out any version of Windows 10, any SKU, any product edition, whatever it is, any form of licensing or whatever, and it's broken the entire up and down the chain. It's broken. Yep. Yep. It's, it, un- it's unreal. It, what's kind of more awkward about this than anything else is that they had to have known that they were going to need to do this when they extended the life cycle of 1511. They could have all done oh, it one course. big thing but instead yeah. they said ah, we'll limp this one along and make it more confusing and then they're going to come out and say ah, you know what we actually kind of changed our mind because nobody can nobody can do rapid release um uh, on a conservative scale you could effectively be down to upgrading to roughly once a year uh when you were going from updating roughly every three years you're not prepared for that and microsoft got really bullish and said you know what we could force modernization upon these people and they all said we don't care because windows doesn't make us money no, I mean, look, there are good news uh, pieces to this. I didn't write about this yet. I'm not sure if I will, but let me let me just bring this up so I don't get this wrong off the top of my head. But there were there was a report about Google G Suite mm-hmm. that I think was based off of their earnings because Alphabet, Google's parent company, I believe, also went out. Oh, maybe it's today they're announcing no, it's today. Their so I'm not really sure what this is tied to, but basically, uh, according to various reports, G Suite has approximately one-tenth of the penetration of Office 365. And as Office 365 grows, it's become increasingly clear that G Suite will always be this distant number two. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess there's less competitive reason to fear you know, the ramifications of what they're doing. But I think generally speaking, the big fear here is at some point, Microsoft will make this so untenable that some of its big customers will finally say, enough. At this point, yep. switching to something that is not Windows 10 will be as easy for us as switching to Windows 10, and we're going to do something different. And it could start with G Suite. It, you know, it may or may not include Chromebooks or Macs or whatever. It doesn't really matter, but I feel like these guys are um, – I, I just feel like this is a huge strategic mistake. 
Right. And I think I think you'll agree with this. This is Microsoft's market to lose, right? They yeah. own it right now. Yep. And every time they do something that kind of screws with the mantra of a business, they sit there and say, ah, fine, we'll, we'll suck it up this time. But eventually something's going to happen. You'll be like, you know what? Screw it. Let's see what other options there are. Eventually there's going to be some guy in a data center somewhere who's like, you know, I'm using this Gmail stuff uh, at home and it works great. Why don't we just use that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, uh, I've often described the Google services, which by the way, are actually usually excellent as being good enough, you know, for most mm-hmm. people. So in an education situation, a Chromebook plus, you know, these Google app services, whatever they are is, is good. It's, it actually is good. Um, Microsoft can lay a claim that it's office 365 office applications, whatever are superior. And, I'm, and yes, there's a great argument to be made there as well. The question is whether that many people need those additional features at that cost and complexity. Mm -hmm. And, man, they're not making a great case for sticking with them. Yep. Other uh, other fun things floating around. Um, the next long-term servicing channel, remember it's no longer long-term servicing branch, uh, will come in the second half of 2018. And that will be supported, I believe, for five-year mainstream and then five-year extended support. So... Oh, I should mention too. Actually, now that you mentioned, now that you said that, uh, I'm reminded that Office 2019 um, will be the first version of Office to break with Microsoft's traditional 10-year support cycle. It will ha- receive mainstream support for five years, which is normal, and then extended support for only two years, Ooh. and then it's done. Yeah, so it's a seven-year cycle, not a ten. Um, that's something to look for because one of the in other products, I mean, um, the reason is. You know, historically, the enterprise stuff has always been 10 years, five mm-hmm. mainstream, five extended. And then, of course, you can pay more for extra. Um, you know, Windows 10 kind of throws that for a loop. You know, with Windows 10, it's supported for the life cycle, uh, the lifetime of the device, but it's not even clear what that means. And uh, Microsoft has been moving to aggressively, um, uh, I guess, deprecate or obsolete older versions of Windows on newer hardware platforms. Um, so far, we've only seen it with Windows 7, but it's only a matter of time before we see it with the Windows 8 and then with early versions of Windows 10. You know, so if you're going to upgrade from Windows 10, you know, 1903 in the future to 1910 or whatever it is, um, you may not be able to because the system you're running it on is like Skylake or something, and they're no longer supporting that um, that type of hardware. And uh, that's going to be an interesting thing to watch going forward, too. Yep. I want this switch. <laughs> <laughs> I will just I will just awkwardly uh, sit here on camera. Switch I'm over. Like Don't a, make like me a, get out of my like chair. Deer Excellent. in the headlamps. Well, it should. I think it's because I'm using a Bluetooth keyboard, I, I believe is the... Uh... This has been an error-free uh, transition. Um, it's working out great. <laughs> there you go. Oh, man. Well, we will get to a wired keyboard for the next time. I don't know why. I clicked the wrong thing there. This is just swimming. <laughs> uh, you got anything else for today, Paul, before I end it for the second time? Uh, nope. How about you? Mm, nope. Nope. All right. Oh, I think it's disconnected completely. I think that's why. There you go. Bluetooth... Uh... Maybe the That's what you get for using a Surface keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the batteries are dead. It's not just ergonomically terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, all right, folks, that does it for today. Uh, we'll wrap it up here. Check out cloudberrylab.com slash FRD for a... Uh, just to learn a little bit more about how to protect yourself from ransomware and all that good stuff and back it up to your own cloud that you bring. Uh, we'll catch you right back here tomorrow on a live show that I'm sure will go much better than today, and I mean that um, with a tongue-in-cheek. So have yourselves a good one. Yeah, it's Bye-bye. Batteries are dead. I assume you're just going to manually fade this out somehow. Yeah. <laughs>